Come to me, my children. It says we're streaming. Yeah, it's starting. It's starting it up. So I need to make sure it actually would show up on the YouTube page here before we get going. I have have faith, total faith. (laughs) Ha ha. And you started with your Evita arms. So it's here now. We need to send people to this room. Great. This is the real recording room. We're going to give people a few minutes to. We got four people watching. Oh my God, what what will we do with this massive audience? It'll grow. I'm Four terrified. Eight. I'm terrified. It's, it's going to grow just the same way that uh, the pandemic spreads. It's it's, it's going to be a logarithmic oh, growth. Good lord! <laughs> and wow. then and then it's sort of by midway through the episode, where like you know, like oh, that's about as fun as it's going to get. We'll flatten the curve. Yeah, and that'll be that'll be the tops. Um, we made it. We made it zero seconds without talking about the pandemic. And we uh, we're doing our best. Doing our best. What are we up to now? Nine people? Do we have nine? Because I don't work. Okay, that's that's a minimum. (laughs) I don't work in front of fewer than 24 people. I'm going to message you the link so that you can- uh, Oh, no, I don't need to see it. You don't want to see it? What for? I'm looking at you. I'm happy. (laughs) You know, I believe you. If this entire thing was a charade just to fool me, I'm fooled. You're fooled. All right, it looks like uh, the folks who are supposed to be able to uh, do stuff are doing stuff. It'll be one more minute and we'll do it. Great. I did ask uh, everyone to press record. All right, that's happening. I'm gonna check the Slack just in case. Uh, there's a Slack. No, These we have things a Slack. I don't know. We up to we up to to 27 people. Yeah, Nina's asking, is there a way to cancel the old streams? Maybe. We are up to 100 people watching. That's not bad. That's not bad. I'm going like, to go. I, I think 14,000 is a reasonable number. Yeah. I'm going to get rid of some of these old streams here. One second. Sure. I don't know what that means. Yeah. I'll be honest with you, people. Don't know what that means. I mean, I can figure out sort of what I think it means, but technically, in terms of what's happening right now, no idea what it means. Just didn't know we had old streams. Well, it's, it's the test things that uh, <sighs> Megan and I did like a few minutes ago just to make sure this was actually working right. I well, hope everybody is doing nice out there and at home. Or are you all gathered together in a bar watching this? All right, so this was the old one. Which is the, yeah, that's, this is the real one, I think. Yeah, so this is the real one. So I'm gonna get rid of the old ones so people don't, don't try to watch the old ones. Cool. And then we'll start. Great. No, it's the top one. Everyone just go to the top one. People figure this out. Guys, go to the top one. Shit. <laughs> language warning, Craig. Yeah, yeah. Uh, language warning. Oh, uh, you knew there was going to be a language warning. There was going to be some. We've language. got Ryan Reynolds and Phoebe Waller Bridge on. Mm. And you, John, the worst yeah, of the bunch. I am the worst. The worst. All right. Craig, are you ready to start this, the show? Yeah. No, I was, I mean, I woke up ready. <laughs> Hello and welcome. My name is John August. My name is Craig Mazin. And this is episode 445 of Script Notes, a podcast about screenwriting and things that are interesting to screenwriters. Today, it's our very first ever live video Script Notes. We have some number of people watching us live on YouTube, each of them wondering, wait, is that what Craig and John actually look like? No, (laughs) No. this is not what we look like. No. No. Um, So we do live shows fairly often, a couple times a year. We do one in Austin, generally. We do a holiday show. Uh, This is a special occasion, so we're doing one live streaming on the internet. Um, People aren't really here to see us. They're here to see our two very special guests we're going to bring out in a moment. Um, We're also today going to have a game segment. Uh, We're going to have audience questions. So it'll be like our normal live shows, except I won't have had one and a half glasses of wine, which is the amount of wine I need, basically, to do a live show. And that's a bummer because you will be one and a half times uh, less entertaining. <laughs> Just gonna be honest, you're on one and a half glasses of wine. You are spectacular. Yes. So uh, this is 10 a.m. We're recording this uh, on a Saturday in Los Angeles. Uh, mm. Different, but people around the world are watching this, which is so exciting. So yeah. as as we're talking right now, I now see that there are let's see how many people are watching us. 654 people. It's it's okay. just our yeah. I think it's we're the on most our way had. to 14,000, which is my that's my target. 14,000, 14, right? Yeah, seems reasonable. It's a small uh, arena. That's how I work. 
so this is free for the world. This is not a fundraiser for anything. This is just a morale raiser. Um, but for our premium subscribers, um, Craig, you don't know that we're going to do this, but we're going to do a post-mortem after the show. Maybe oh. tomorrow we'll record it to figure out what we learned and what went well, what went wrong in the process. Great. Yeah, Great. I'm sure that uh, under what went wrong, uh, I will feature heavily. <laughs> um, it is a weird moment in which we're all now just like broadcasters. Like somehow we're supposed to like, you know, be doing like television. Um, just everyone. Yeah, yeah. No, it turns out that broadcasting is not the rare talent that we were all told it was. Mm -mm -mm. You know, anyone can do it in their basement. Yeah, when people would say, "You're no brain surgeon or radio broadcaster." Well, no, we're all broadcasters now. Yeah, we're all broadcasters now. It's not hard. Not hard. All right. Um, let us welcome our two very, very special guests. Um, first off, can I welcome Phoebe Waller Bridge? She is an Emmy and Golden Globe winning writer and actor whose credits include Killing Eve and Fleabag. She's joining us from London. Phoebe Bridge, please turn on your camera and join us on Script Notes. Phoebe! Phoebe! She is. We did it! Oh, we did it. <laughs> looks just like she does on TV. It's amazing. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, actors are, are, are wonderful, beautiful people. Phoebe, it is so wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much. It was a fantasy to have you on the show at all, but to have you all the way from London is a special, special treat for oh, all of us. Thanks for having me. Um, our second guest, Ryan Reynolds is an actor, writer, producer, gin magnet, and somehow a wireless provider. He's known for such films as Deadpool and The Nines. Uh, Ryan Reynolds, <laughs> welcome to Script Notes. <laughs> Yay! Yay, Very Ryan nice. Reynolds. Very nice. You forgot some of my awards, like MTV Movie Award Best Kiss nominee, mm -hmm. 1998. It's a good year. Yeah, it's very good. Here. Who I won? Remember that. I remember that. Who would have possibly beaten you? Uh, pretty sure it was Toby Maguire. Hi, everybody. Oh, upside down. Upside this down. Very here. exciting. Yeah, it's no, really nice it? to, It's nice to have everyone here together uh, around the world uh, to, to talk and to do things. And we're all looking directly at our camera lenses, which is something I sort of want to, a question I want to start off asking the two of you about because. Um, Last week on the show, we were talking about Clueless. We did a deep dive on Clueless, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. We were talking about how important Cher's narration was in Clueless because she is talking directly to us as an audience about her experiences. We would not understand the movie without that. But the two of you are known for looking directly at the lens and like talking to the audience and having a relationship with the audience as characters that is so different than most movies. Um, so I'll start with you, Phoebe. Like, as a writer and as a performer, how do you make that decision to like, you know, suddenly start talking directly to the people watching? And how does it, what's the decision process in terms of when is the right time to sort of break that seal? Well, with, in, well Fleabank started as a play and it was a one woman play. Um, and so that was all directed to the audience anyway. And I always felt like I wanted the experience of the, uh, the audience experience to be that they feel like they know someone really intimately and then and then they get sort of betrayed by her sort of halfway through so it's kind of it's it starts off as a sort of mini sort of stand-up act and um and then you realize halfway through that actually there's sort of more going on and by the time you like her and she's made you laugh she then divulges things to you that you feel uncomfortable about but you feel complicit in that moment and so bringing that into the tv show sort of felt like a no-brainer um, but then what was hard was that when I was doing the play, I was the only, um, you know, I was the only person there. It was a lonelier experience. Um, but also I was in total, like that, the character in that was completely in control of the narrative. Whereas suddenly in, uh, in the TV show, there's actual real life things happening around that are also truthful. So I had to kind of shift it. So she wasn't just the only person describing the world. You could see the world. So then it had to become about her, about having fun with it a bit more. So she would tell you some, someone's gonna behave in a certain way and then they don't. Mm. And then she's actually uh, a bit knocked by that. Um, so lots of little sort of games and stuff that we were playing throughout it. But overall, for me in the TV show, it was to create a relationship between Fleabag and the camera that actually changed and evolved itself. So at the beginning, she's sort of like, come in, this is going to be fun and sexy and cool. And, and uh, I'm in total control. And then by the end of the first season, the camera won't leave when she wants it to. And so she's like, ah, fuck, I should never have done that. I should never have let you in. <laughs> um, so it sort of made it a, a, a central relationship. Is there any uh, parallel to your actual life now that the camera <laughs> will not leave you alone? Oh, fuck, why did I do that? 
I mean, yeah, that uh, goes quite close to the bone there, yeah. Greg. Good. That's my job here is to upset. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Ryan, say something that I can then make you feel bad about. Oh, please. There's a, there's a whole list, alphabetical and chronological, you could probably make me feel bad about. Um, uh, no, I, sorry, go ahead. Well, Ryan, I was going to say, like, as long as I've known you, you've been trying to make the Deadpool movie. So, I mean, you were always sort of obsessed with this character, and this character on the, in the comic books did break that fourth wall and seemed to be aware that he was in a comic book. But yeah. at, at what stage did it become clear that, like, oh, this is, in playing this role, I will be directly addressing the audience, that there's going to be a relationship between me and the audience that's different yeah. than sort of a normal hero? Um, well, yeah, I, I, I th on Deadpool in particular, there, there's he hasn't very intimate relationship with the audience. I mean, even the, the, by virtue of the fact that Deadpool exists is exclusively because of the internet and the audience that made it happen after the test, test footage leaks that we'd made years before. Uh, they were the ones that sort of generated the energy that, that convinced the studio to say, yes, we'll make this film. So um, it sort of started off that way. And then uh, I love it. I mean, I love how intimate there's an intimate relationship there. Deadpool's constantly acknowledging and playing with the cultural landscape. And I think in doing that, there's a bit of a nod, nod, wink, wink with the audience. Um, so it's always been something, it's, it's, it's just something to be judicious about with us. I mean, I find that less is more with it. I mean, by the second movie, I think we've done it about half as much as the first one, but uh, but I, I, do, I do love it. I do love a good fourth wall break. There's something about that connection that both of you guys do that is, um, that I, find fascinating in its relationship to comedy particularly because because I do love comedy, you're both hysterical. Fleabag is wonderfully funny. Deadpool is wonderfully funny. But you are also talking to the man that was crying on a plane at the end of Deadpool 2. Crying, uh, like, <laughs> like a lot. <laughs> um, and I was crying a lot because I cared. Um, and the efficacy of alcohol is much more severe on an airplane. I <laughs> wasn't even drinking. <laughs> I was not drinking. It was just that because, you know, you loved her and you got to say goodbye. Anyway, the point is, when you are having these conversations with people, it seems to me that you are also getting at something that is true underneath comedy in general, which is that funny characters at their best are funny because we understand also that they are sad. That in some way there is something profoundly sad about everyone that is being really, really funny. And I'm curious what you think about that in terms of how you create your particular characters that you're so well known for and why people connect to them so well, especially when they're kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, is this to me or to Phoebe? It's I'm not sure. Both of, it both you, of you. You, Ryan. Oh, wow, thank you, Phoebe. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I, I'll, I could speak and hopefully this will be pithy, but I do think that, that the, the key difference is, you know, one is obnoxious and then and then funny to me is usually steeped or filtered through some kind of prism of pain or you've earned it in some way. Um, otherwise, you're just kind of, you know, just spouting obnoxious jokes. So um, that's always the trick. I know certainly for Deadpool, it's always the trick to weight the B side of everything or the A side, depending on um, how it's constructed, but with, with some pathos or some kind of, you know, pain. And, and it's also the what I find most challenging about writing on Deadpool is that you know we 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 really have to take everything away from this guy in order for him to exist. Otherwise, he would just be too much. So you have to for both of those movies, we have to strip everything that he holds dear away in order to give or create this real estate in which he could we can sort of create a bit of a playground. So making that guy the underdog by virtue of his face, he's all sort of scarred up. He has you know he looks sort of hideous under the mask. All those kinds of things. Those are all. Uh, I think those are all the, the, the key ingredients to allowing this guy to sort of spread his wings and fly and be as funny as, as possible. So um, it's that's, that's the sort of unsexy work that goes into it, and, you know. Uh, but I, I do think that, I, before, I just don't want to forget this, I think the most beautiful use of a fourth wall break I've ever seen is Phoebe's in the last season of Fleabag, that goodbye was, uh, <laughs> I just it pulled every, every, oh, every vital source of oxygen out of my body. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever it's, seen. It's also, I mean, just sort of let's just, let's just buffer up a little bit more here. Um, the, the, the moment where Andrew Scott notices the camera was one oh. of the first acts of actual cinematic invention I think I've seen <laughs> ever. 
Because I think by the time like I came along in 1971, they'd invented everything. Like we had flashbacks and montages, people had broken the, but that was astonishing. It was so, it was, the, it was a brand new way to tell people in an audience, she's in love with him and he's special and he deserves it because he's on that. What a brilliant, what a brilliant thing to do. Why are you so smart? There's your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm going to put it down to um, basically that, do you ever, I don't know if uh, you guys have had this, but you know, sometimes when you, you slightly disassociate yourself from ideas that you have, because that one I do, I remember having that idea really early on before I'd even come up with the character of the priest and thinking, fuck, that is smart. <laughs> See? <laughs> and then like, it happens, but it's like outside of you. So like all the like painful stuff happens, like when you're actually trying to like make something uh, like work or fit together. But there are moments and I mean, it literally just, I was thinking that would be, it was more or less, it was, Fuck, this is smart more like that would be cool or like that way. and it just like affected affected me in a way when I thought god what would that mean for her because I think like Ryan was saying you're constantly trying to find a way to throw rocks at your characters and like um and especially if they're funny because being funny takes a confidence and also to be able to be relentlessly funny takes an awful lot of effort and I think if you meet people in real life who are just like constantly on you know, you think the feet are paddling so hard underneath and you think, what are you, why are you working so hard? Yes, yes. Like, what are you hiding? Yes. <laughs> what happens when you stop? And I think, um, and in some ways, that was what the idea with Fleabag began anyway, was that she was just the first five minutes of this, like when I first started writing the play, was just joke, 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 joke. And I was getting exhausted and I was like, she is clearly miserable. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then it was finding out what that was. But I also think that there's something really uh, heroic about people who try and be funny because you can be because you can you can die multiple times uh, in a moment and there's a real risk in it. And so people being really funny in a really heartbreaking situation can feel both heroic or can feel kind of cowardly at the same time. And I think that's a really um, fun thing to be able to play with in a moment. And also the moments that a character isn't funny or doesn't crack a joke and actually lets you in a little bit is um, is a really powerful tool to have. Right. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I, but I have to believe that they're all um, the, the funniest people in the world and in deep, deep pain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It's like yes. you say, like, otherwise it is just endlessly, um, it just gets boring after a while. Right. So a question for both Phoebe and Ryan, um, as you're doing asides to the camera, as you're having this direct relationship with the audience, um, as the writer and as the actor, who are you seeing there as the audience? Are you are you really playing it to the, the, the camera operator right behind that? Or are you trying to picture the viewer at home? Like who is the, the person you're having the relationship with when you're doing these asides? Uh, well, I, I mean, I typically just write down the barrel. Uh, I'm also not, you know, I don't come from any particular, <laughs> as you may or may not know, school of acting. So I don't have a, like, I don't, a person, tennis ball, whatever, um, you know, <laughs> I can do it. Uh, so I don't, you know, I don't, I don't need to have that uh, extra feedback in order to kind of pull off the, the, the two camera look. It does help if I enjoy the uh, A camera operator in the moment, cause uh, you know, I feel like it's sort of delivering it right to him or her, but um, that's, uh, yeah, that's, it's no, it's just right, right down the barrel. You know, if the camera's too close though, you, you know, you get a little cross-eyed and I'm naturally cross-eyed. <laughs> uphill battle but yeah maybe who who is the audience as you're doing your things um it, just the just the audience um i think I, i'm the same i didn't think of anything um too romantic to think about because i think i don't know how i'd act that actually having mm -hmm. to act continuously that there's another mysterious person that i'm thinking of and then trying to communicate to that to the audience would feel like a complicated message to get over which is why I think but so yeah I just imagined uh an audience and also because I felt like the part of it for um for Fleabag was just like desperately trying to keep their attention so every time looking at the camera was um just sort of like stay with me I'm here and then when yeah. it changed it would be like oh don't look at me so sometimes it was a it was a happy welcoming thing and sometimes it would feel like you know an evil eye um mm. But yeah, the, the, the relationship with uh, my DOP, who's a camera operator as well, was really, um, 
was really important, especially when he was like, put your face down, you look, you look gross. <laughs> 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 it's like, head up, head up, like that. But, um, but I really love what, but what, um, in, in Deadpool 1 as well, that really little moment when you just push the camera aside and you just give us that little break and you go, I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's like the fact that he has care for us in it really yeah. like, so much of it, there's so much bravado and then he's yeah. actually like oh, actually yeah. give, uh, you know, give yourself a break no, sorry. Really. yeah if you just give me a I yeah. forgot I did that my god no. yeah. well the, these, the, the show and the, the Fleabag and the Deadpool movies both have this meta awareness which does not undermine the reality of what they're doing at all it, it kind of oddly enhances it. Um, it's, it's a common thing, I think, for people to think when they're writing something that if you start to break the fourth wall, what you're doing is blowing apart the reality of the situation. Therefore, people will not care about the characters. So I'm kind of curious as you guys went through this process and Ryan, I know you were writing on Deadpool 2, the movie that I believe in a plane is the saddest movie. <laughs> um, um, as you were writing, was this a concern that maybe by doing this too much or in the wrong places that you would undermine what was real and what people would care about? Or did you have an, an, an innate sense that if it was done in certain ways in certain times, it would actually make us connect more to the fake reality of the world you were building? I think it's both. I think it's a cheat and it's a, for me at least, I'm not gonna speak for Phoebe or anyone else, but for me, it's a bit of a cheat, you know? I think it, it, it um, you want to be very judicious with it and you want to make sure that you're not overdoing it, obviously. But, uh, um, you know, there's a whole sequence. I remember, you know, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I find I could spend two days. I, first off, let me just say, this is the perfect reason. I hate writing. I just hate it. It's mm. the worst thing ever. No, um, and yeah. And, 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 you know, I find that I can get fixated on two lines for like four straight days. I can just be, you know, hammering away at, fixated on these two other ones. I should just be moving on. And, you know, and then other days I can put out 20, 30 pages, but I remember there's this one scene in uh, Deadpool 2, which is like a 15 page scene, which is already a bit of a no-no, uh, you know, just in a, a film. Slightly. <laughs> yeah, but it's a scene where Deadpool's lost his lower lower half of his body and he's these little child legs growing back. And I, and I loved writing it because there's, as long as you can go in the scene without revealing these child legs was to me was very funny. Um, and then, you know, we get into some kind of weird sort of cinematic trope where I break the fourth wall and I, and I, oh, so we're talking about time travel, that was it, which is also another just horrendous thing to write. And I remember breaking the fourth wall and saying, that's just lazy writing. Um, so, you know, really like it's a, that's a complete cheat because it was lazy writing and we're forgiven <laughs> for it to a certain degree by right. acknowledging that it's lazy writing uh, and then kind of carrying on. But, you know, I, I, I tend to use it initially as a crutch a lot and it's rarely written in to the, to the screenplays. I mean, Deadpool one, um, we almost never wrote it in. And then Deadpool two, I think it was written in one, at one point during a wow. extraordinarily belabored death sequence at the end of the movie. I, mm -hmm. I just uh, did a couple in the script I wrote, you know, straight to camera. But uh, other than that, we didn't, you know. You had decided to, you had decided to do it before filming though, but you wasn't in the script. Um, oh, oh yes, oh, a hundred percent. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. we would break in the fourth wall. I mean, that, that's actually not a invention of ours. That's that's from the comic books. He's he's constantly talking right, right. to the reader, the reader in the comics. So, um, but we did this elaborate death sequence at the end of Deadpool two, and I and I was just doing everything. At one point, I even did somebody's uh, award speech from the Golden Globes straight to camera. It was another person's. <laughs> I mean, it was just absolutely kitchen sink type oh, stuff. See, but it's. Moment, uh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, just con con on and on and on and on. But um, but it was, uh, uh, yeah, I, I do love it. I mean, I do really love that sort of, after a while, it creates a bit of a trust, I think, there, you know, and just as long as you don't, you know, overdo it. So you didn't, you planned for it to happen, but you did not plan ahead in terms of actually writing what it was that you were going to say or even when it was going to happen. Whereas Phoebe... No. I'm just going to go out on a limb here and think that you planned it all pretty carefully because you were coming from the stage where obviously you had to perform every night in a certain way. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'd crumble under the pressure to like be able to be spontaneous with the straight to camera. <laughs> I would, I like, I, I would lean on the script. Um, but yeah, and we, so that in terms of how many times I spoke to the camera, that was really scripted, but there were looks that weren't scripted. Um, and I was just, I mean, I went with abandon with that when we were shooting 
and then um and then we just took them all out <laughs> <laughs> Not <laughs> all. i was like being all creative yeah i and like there was there's a cut of the first episode of the second series when um i just wanted to see what it looked like when there was just no looks to camera or, or no talking to camera at all to see what my poor editor gary was sort of like are we really gonna do this <laughs> and uh uh-huh. and just to see like how it sits without it so you can feel the the like the the impact of it again um, and we just stripped it so far back because i think it can it can get irritating because there's a self-awareness about it and somebody being consistently self-aware all the time is a bit like the same thing as someone making jokes the whole time, but it's almost right. like commenting on what's happening. Um, and so I did put it back quite a lot, but God, I really went for it in a few scenes and <laughs> it's a shame. You did, but you, you would, you would side eye the, the, the camera though, yeah. which I just was one of my favorite things that you would do in an emotional <laughs> moment or just be this little side eye glance to the cat was so- I do those oh, and I try and do them like in my house sometimes if something happens- Always. Up, there's like, there's one thing that I always do from um, the Howard Stern movie, Private Parts, where he's he's gotten his first job at, at a radio station and he pours Dr. Pepper on a, on the re- record and he goes <laughs> like this and I'll do that anytime I drop something. And now if I screw something up or somebody says something ridiculous, I'll just sometimes look over. I'll look over to a flea bag counter and just go. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, yeah, good. You've, you've ruined me. Love that. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Well, let's talk about self-awareness because both of you are, are writing things in which you are going to star and you're gonna be the, the principal person we're gonna see on screen. and it must change your relationship to the material and to all your collaborators. So you are the person, you're the face of this thing, but you have the directors, you have producers, you have other actors in the thing. How do you balance, um, especially when you, both in production, but when you get to post, how do you balance um, your relationship as like the, the person who created this thing with the person who's the centerpiece star of it? How do you know, you know, how do you take in outside feedback to make sure you're doing the right things that, you know, it, you are at the center of this whole project. How do you make sure that it actually makes sense? Who do you turn to and how do you have those conversations? Ryan, I'll start with you. How do you, um, yeah. who do you enlist in your sort of circle of trust? Because if you are the, the camera's aimed at you and you're talking directly to the camera, how do you know when you've gone too far? How do you know when to rein it back in? Uh, uh, well, I, um, First off, fuck everyone else's opinion. There we go. Um, there it is. Second, I knew it. Secondly, I knew it. no, <laughs> no. I, I, I am, I am so self-loathing. Uh, you know, look, this whole, this panel of people right here have forgotten more about screenwriting on this call than I'll ever know. But I'll, I'll right. start with that. But I'll, I'll say this though. I, I, I am so self-loathing that there is no part of me that is really precious about more me in anything, I, 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 do, I do struggle, you know, uh, this film I, I did this year called Free Guy, uh, which is m- one of my favorite things I, I, I've ever been a part of. Um, it, I, I struggled writing other people mm-hmm. in it. Um, not, not myself uh, so much, but I did struggle, you know, make, make, maintain, make, making sure that their voices felt three-dimensional and, 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 and important. And, and, you know, there's, uh, it's easy to give other people jokes. Uh, it's just, but I, I, yeah, in the in the post production process, sitting in there, I have no problem. My biggest problem is pulling out too much stuff. You know, I'll start to, you know, I'll pull stuff out, and then you know, the editor, or or in this case, Sean Levy, who I was working with, the, the director and and producer, he he would say that you're you're taking out exposition at this point, <laughs> like you're taking out important information <laughs> that we need to know just because you don't want yourself. So um, yeah, that that's never been a, a huge problem of, 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 of mine. And, but then there's also the flip side is I, I can get a little crazy about certain jokes or beats mm-hmm. or things that are for whatever reason, super important to me. But, um, you know, I take feedback in a test audience the same way anyone else takes feedback in a test audience. I can, you know, walk away. And if, if there's a, you know, resounding no to something, then it's got to go. And it's, uh, yeah. So. Phoebe, Phoebe uh, self-loathing also. <laughs> Yeah, huge amounts of self-loathing um, all the way through every part of the process. I, I lean really heavily on my director, Harry Bradbeer, and my producer, Jenny Robbins, um, because they are really brutally honest, <laughs> however much that hurts. It's very valuable. Um, but also there are, certain, there are some times when I could, I'd, it's like from a performance point of view, I'd feel just there's so much going on sometimes I just wouldn't know and like something something like that feeling like you're like in it when you're also like written it and running it and all that kind of stuff is is like 
is a luxury. I didn't feel very like in it all the time, like as an actor. Um, I'm sure I don't actually know if I've ever felt like that, to be honest. <laughs> 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 but, um, um, but so I would, I'd just be like, is it funny? Is it sad? Basically, it's like the yeah. question that would be like thrown across the set. It's like, right. sad enough. And then Harry would be like, sadder. Um, <laughs> so I really rely on them. Um, and then I suppose, um, Oh, I can't remember what the other thing I was going to say. What was the other thing that Ryan said? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Yeah. I don't know. He's, he's not good at mm-hmm. writing. And no. Yeah, and, and no, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's really a terrible not, actor. Not he's great. great actor. And, really no, bad I'm, I'm okay at <laughs> well, some stuff. I'm okay at some. I can drink like a fish. Um, yeah. Oh, I, I know. Ryan I, th- I, Ryan, I think we can help you out because, you know, from the very start of, of Script Notes, we've been trying to offer sort of useful advice and, to steer sure. people away from bad advice uh, that they often to get um, as mm. screenwriters because new screenwriters are sort of inundated. They read the books, they go online, they look through um, all these guides to teach you how to you know, be a better screenwriter, how to even get started as a screenwriter. So I thought we might play a game, the four of us together, um, to sort of uh, to figure out sort of like, uh, you know, how to sort through the good advice and the bad advice. So um, what I did last night is I went online and I Googled screenwriting mistakes and I pulled some of the advice I found online about screenwriting mistakes. And uh, I'm gonna invite on a contestant to play this game with us. Uh, Paige, if you could unmute yourself and turn on your video. Hey, Paige. Hi, Hi Paige. Paige. Paige, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I am Paige Feldman. I'm a writer and director. I'm living in Los Angeles. I just signed my first feature deal like on Monday. Wow. Yay, congratulations. Wow. How about that? We yeah. are really, I mean, our listeners are our are, are quality. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> now, now, Paige, this is going to be a game segment. So what I've done is I've, I've pulled this advice from the internet, but I've also introduced some things I've just made up myself. And so your nice. job is going to be to figure out what was real bad advice and what is fake bad advice. And so okay. as, a, as a new screenwriter, <laughs> this is important stuff for you to figure out. Now, I should ask you, have you ever played on a, on a game show before? Yes, I was uh, a contestant on Jeopardy in the team tournament when I was 16. Um, wait, wait, so. hold on, hold on, hold on. What? Where have you been on my life? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's, walk, let's walk right, that back a second. Yeah, Craig. Yeah, um, I, me. okay. Rooms too. <laughs> so, okay, here we go. Here Paige, we go. you have to tell us about this team tournament. So um, how did you do? Like, what were, what were the questions <laughs> that got you? Tell us. So um, I lost in the first round, um, lost on Final Jeopardy. Oh, okay. Um, what was the answer? Were... What was the question? Let's see if we can get it. Craig will probably get it. We'll see. <laughs> we'll try. I'll try. All right. In 1859, this man said to Horace Greeley, I have 15 wives. I know no one who has more. Ooh, that was 18 what? I think it was 59. I mean, it was in 2001 that 18. I was on the like, show. So this have is- Have you got people in your head for the other years, Craig? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna guess. I was gonna guess Brigham Young, but I'm not sure. I was gonna guess Joseph uh, Smith, but I don't think yeah, we're right. Yeah, I was gonna go Joseph Smith. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was the biggest. <laughs> I was Brigham Smith. Yeah, Smith. Yeah. Smith. Oh, Paige, what is the answer? It is Brigham Young. Oh, you got oh! it! You picked oh the right God. Mormon on nice August. Won the Jeopardy team tournament, John. Wow, fantastic! Uh, what? Uh, who did you pick out of curiosity, Paige? I had absolutely no idea because I didn't know who Horace Greeley was when oh. I was 16. Um, so I just chose For the only shame. person I knew who had a lot of wives, which was Henry VIII, even though I knew he only had six. And I just, I enjoyed myself on uh, on the show until I got eliminated. And then I got to watch all of my friends do fantastically, so. Cool. All right, well, uh, I all right. hope that they all Let's see. Let's hope now. you can do better on this one. I think you probably yeah. will do better yeah. on this one. <laughs> High All stakes. right, so let's start with some really basics of and formatting. So okay. I would ask, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have Craig start with the first bit of advice. So this will be A, B, and C. Okay. Craig, you start. Basics of formatting. Is it A, only use fade in and fade out at the beginning and end of your script? Or is it B, Dissolve to is the proper transition to use within the script if needed. Or is it C? Make sure to underline jokes in your script so that even idiot actors can understand them. (laughs) Save italics for dramatic moments like when Deadpool remembers his hot dead wife. (laughs) 
love that moment. <laughs> so Paige, uh, which is the fake uh, answer there? Um, I am going to guess it's C unless Ryan was ad-libbing the idiot actor's part. <laughs> all right. C is the correct one. Very uh, much so. All right. So no. off to a good She's start. She's good, guys. She's good. She's good. She's good. She's, She's on it. Very good. <laughs> good. We're going to have to step this up. Let's question two. Let's start talk about technique on the page. Phoebe, why don't you start us off? Is it A? When you're writing scene description, it's okay to use we see as a way to communicate an image or action every now and then. Ah, the controversial we see. Mm. All right. Ryan, B. Slug lines should not contain dates or times. Mm, mm. No dates or times of slug lines. Mm. Or is it C, Craig? Every screenwriter worth his or her salt uses final draft, period. Hey, what do you say, A, B, or C? This one's a little bit tougher, but I'm going to guess it's A because there's so much like, no one should ever use we see happening, which is silly. Uh, the correct answer was C. I made that up just so Craig would have to say to use final draft. <laughs> I'm so angry. I'm so angry for so many reasons. On uh, page, I thought Craig, you knew me, you know. Craig, Craig, do you, do you, are you like John where you just charcoal sketch your scripts? Is that- No, 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 John has, uh, John goes from legal pads to his own proprietary software. Uh, yeah. And then at some point, I think he ultimately does the formatting within one of his many multiprocessors. Yeah. Uh, whereas I use a yeah. lovely program called Fade In Pro. Uh, yes. But I, I do not. I do not like Final Draft. Um, I'm on I record. just switched to Fade In. Oh, good for you. Yeah, well hey, done. Hey. Um, and Craig, John most, Island. Mostly, Craig, I wanted you saying that on the air so that they can snip that out and, and use it. I know, I know exactly why. All right. And I'm, uh, and I'm not upset, but a little bit. Question three. Uh, talk about nuance and detail. Ryan, can you start us off? In, screen, in screenplays, detail is poison. Film is a collaborative art form. The director, cinematographer, set designer, makeup artist, supervisor, special effects supervisor, and so many others will decide the details. Now, your job is to convey the broad stroke image as quickly as possible so the reader can visualize it quickly and move on to the next image they're supposed to be seeing. Or is it B? Whatever you do, don't have your protagonist look to the camera and deliver a devastating line. <laughs> Or is it C? If your character isn't listening to music and you simply included the song as something to be played over the scene, that is not your job. Paige, tell us, A, B, or C? Um, while I would assume that B would be given as advice if someone wanted to, I'm thinking that it's probably a little too specific to Phoebe, so I'm gonna guess B. You are correct, correct. <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to be playing this song. So Oh. You hear it, Sean? Oh, there you go. So just to be clear, John, the, the ones that, the other ones, they're real things that they're you've read on? They're real things. Oh so in God. the show notes, I'll provide links to where oh I took these God. all from. These are actual articles online. So things about like wow. uh, detail is poison, that came from an online thing. Well, <laughs> we're going to ruin that person's day. <laughs> oh, I'll say. Life. Jesus. All right, question four. Uh, structure. Oh, structure is a big bugaboo. People have a hard time with structure. They uh, whole structure. books are written about structure. Phoebe, can you start us off with answer A? A. In a properly structured movie, the story consists of six basic stages, which are defined by five key turning points in the plot. Not only are these turning points always the same, they always occupy the same positions in the story. Mm. Or is it B? <laughs> At the exact midpoint of your screenplay, your hero must fully commit to her goal. Or is it C? Do not indicate where to place the title of the film or where to roll the credits. These notations are superfluous in a speculative script. Such matters are usually decided by the director. Paige, oh. tough one here, uh, A, B, or C? I feel like I've heard all of these. Um, I am gonna guess, I'm gonna go with B. Uh, they were all, it's a true question, they were all actual things I pulled out. Uh, <laughs> wow. So-called experts said all of these things. Then my first instinct was, was correct. Your first instinct was correct. <laughs> we're going to give you the chime. All right, final question. Uh, these are the takeaway lessons we can sort of get out of what we've learned. Craig, start us off. A. For a character to be engaging, even likable, they have to be deeply flawed. All right. Or is it oh. B? Uh, physical descriptions, including race, height, clothing, etc., matter far less than most writers think. Leave the costuming up to the costume designer. Mm. Or is it C? 
You may think that there are rules for how a screenplay is supposed to work, but in fact, there are merely conventions. And while it's important you understand the conventions, you should use them as a foundation upon which to build your own work rather than a straitjacket to constrain you, because after all, isn't that the point of art? Oh. <laughs> Paige, oh. what's the answer? I mean, this this is about bad screenwriting advice, and C was very good screenwriting advice, so let's go with C. C is correct. <laughs> Paige, you have won the game. I'm not even sure what you won. You got a chance to hang out with us on, on the Zoom. That uh, is winning. Thank, thank you so much. Good luck with your screenplay. Uh, sorry about Teen Jeopardy, but I hope this made up for it. Absolutely. It's, it's better than Teen Jeopardy. Thank you guys so much. Well Great. done, nice Paige. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Paige. Bye. Bye-bye. You know, better than Teen Jeopardy was all I ever wanted. Yeah, it is. Um, John Brigham Young, like just pulling that out. Pull it out. So that, that's that's Colorado. That's growing up in Colorado. So Horace Greeley. There's Greeley, Colorado is named for Horace Greeley. So I had a sense of sort of the time and the place of it all. That's that's just you know sometimes you're, you're born lucky. Very good. Very good. Very good. I have a specific question for Phoebe and Ryan, just because you are the two people who actually have done this uh, hosting Saturday Night Live. You both hosted. When you get to that the end credit things, how do you know which person to hug first? I always stay for the end credits, I wanna see the hugs. How do you know which person to hug first? And does one of the cast members come up to you first? Usually it's the musical guest you sort of hug first, but tell us what is the decision process on who to hug first at the end of Saturday Night Live? I aim, I aim for hierarchy. I just go for the most powerful person on the stage first and then work my way down right. to the audience. Right. Right. Oh. <laughs> and then through the you? audience in hierarchy as well. <laughs> yes, yeah, one hundred. And then to my family through that hierarchy <laughs> as well. Yeah. Phoebe, Phoebe what At was the end decision of process? Firm. Yeah. <laughs> I actually got stuck in in a non hug whirl of pain at the end of mine because I was next. I was between. I was sandwiched between Taylor Swift and Matthew Broderick, and I'd already hugged Taylor earlier, mm. <laughs> and yeah. I'd never even met Matthew. So suddenly, when the when they were like, now's the time to like. Fucking yeah. like touch them. Um, I was like, I turned to Taylor and was like, well, we've done this, so I should probably go and do it. It's all happened in like a split second. I should probably go to Matthew and then give her a look as she was coming in. Oh. And so I like oh, no. Taylor, so you- turned to Matthew, who was already like on his way back, had to like claw him back. And then he'd kind of already gone. Then I turned around and Taylor said to me, I'll hug you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, someone actually sent me a gif of the whole thing. Oh, oh no! <laughs> One of us will be watching that right after yeah. this. In fact, we'll we'll put a link to that in the show notes. I may that, leave that for sounds, a moment to watch it. I mean, I, I need that to sounds it good. Yeah. Wow. All right. Yeah. Uh, we have ha- we have a bunch of people who are watching the show. We have a uh, one thousand two hundred seventy seven people watching the show right now live. Thirteen and some of them have, fewer have, than I thought, but okay, good. All right. Um, some of those people have written in with questions already. Uh, Megan Arau, our producer, if she can. Uh, unmute herself and come on the show. She's gonna read some of the questions that people have joined us with. Hi, Megan, Megan, welcome. Hi, Megan. Hello. Um, right. Okay, great. Megan, start us off with a question from our listeners slash viewers. Okay, we've gotten so many questions. So the first one is from Brady and he says, aside from Beyonce who inspires us all, what's the most obscure place you've pulled creative inspiration from for your projects? Um, Brady also says, PS, I love you all. Oh, Brady, we love you too. Um, obscure place of inspiration, where where you get stuff from. I accidentally, I was, uh, I was a little bit stuck and I just try and pick up like random things and I'm a bit stuck and just have a read of like, sometimes like three sentences can just get your head out or something. And I picked up a book called uh, Vagina mm. um, by Naomi Wolf. Uh, that was on the side. It was like my friend's, uh, um, my friend's book, and I'd seen it hanging around. I'm wanting to read it for ages, but I literally opened it at one chapter and I read like five sentences of it, and it gave me the idea of the godmother orgasming when she paints, which then spread <laughs> like, the, which then like rolled into loads of other stuff because it's this beautiful chapter about um, how like orgasms can connect to your creativity and. Uh, and so it really helped. So I just dove straight into a vagina. Mm-hmm. Wow. I've, I've done Passage. that, but it, it hasn't, <laughs> I mean, I haven't gotten any great work out of it. Yeah. Be honest. <laughs> yeah. It's distracting, frankly. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll usually, I'll dip into music. I mean, I find anthemic uh, synth rock, Phil Collins. That'll like, I don't know why that'll just pull me right out. Um, 
whatever kind of uh, funk I'm in. Um, yeah, mostly music. Like, yeah, like Enya, like weird stuff you wouldn't expect. Nothing, like, yeah, weird, sort of not unexpected kind of stuff that's like melodic and synthy and I don't know. Yeah, for some reason it shakes me out. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Megan, another question. Okay, this one is for Ryan, and but I guess you can all speak to it. So uh, it came oh. in from another Ryan and he says, after being in a one room film like Buried, how did that change your relationship with locations in any given scene? Oh yeah, oh. so yeah, oh. buried. I, I I enjoyed your film buried. So it, in the film buried, you are in a coffin for basically the entire entire film. How did <laughs> yeah. how, did, how did it change your feeling about sets? Um, well, you know, funny thing about buried was it was shot in Barcelona. <laughs> it takes place in a coffin. I was like, can we just shoot this in my fucking living room? I, why, why are we going to Barcelona? Um, but yes, it was, it was, uh, you know, set, but sets, it does, it, well, it does, I don't know if it changed my relationship to sets, but it certainly was a lesson in that. Cause you do think, okay, it's just, this thing is a single location. It's a, it's a claustrophobic movie, isolationist kind of film, but actually there were 17 coffins that we shot in there. Each one had a different sort of purpose. And so it really did require a tremendous amount of, of engineering and crew and space and that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, locations are, locations are, uh, uh, as far as in my mentality, they're kind of irrelevant. I don't really think about it like that necessarily. But yeah, I do remember that. That was a lot of travel for one one uh, coffin. Yeah. Phoebe, for Fleabag, did you write two specific locations? Do you, like, do you know that, oh, this is the, the coffee shop I want to be using? Did you have places in mind as you're writing or is it just normal location scouting after you had scripts? <clears throat> Yeah, well, a mixture of both, actually. I think um, there were one or two places that I felt I would write to and I felt really um, I felt really connected to. Like, there's a scene in a Quaker hall in uh, season two and actually Andrew Scott, who plays a priest in it, had taken, when I was first pitching the idea to him for the show, we met up in Soho and he, we were talking about like religion, all, all sorts of stuff for hours. And then he, at the end of it, said, I want to show you something. And he took me into that Quaker hall um, and we sat and spoke in there. There was no one else in there, we're breaking the rules. But then it was really, I really desperately wanted that location for the real thing, just for the, you know, cause it was gorgeous, but also it just was in the center of London, just felt really good. And also we, it had that history between us and we couldn't get it. And so we were, we'd got another place somewhere else. And in the last minute that one fell through and the one we loved came available. And so we got to uh, film in there in the end, but, um, and it is really joyful. I think when you find yourself in, in locations that you've written to, but it's it's rare, I think, that everything mm -hmm. falls into place that you can. Great. Megan, another question. Okay, awesome. So Eleanor asks, as a writer, are you ever insecure about using autobiographical elements in your work? Um, with a follow-up from Andy, who says, when you incorporate something that's like vulnerable, are you ever surprised when people praise you for that instead of judging you? Great. So incorporating autobiographical elements and sort of the vulnerability that happens with that. I mean, Ryan, you and I can speak to like uh, the movie we did, The Nines, like that middle character you play, you play three characters, the middle character is sort of me. And so uh, yeah. one of the initial conversations we had to, to have was sort of like, you know, you're free to take anything you want to take from me, like my mannerisms, my, my whatever. And uh, it was really great and weird to sort of see it being mirrored back, but it, it worked well together. Um, mm -hmm. And so you're, incorporating stuff from the real world. I do always kind of, particularly if I'm, if this is the moment that I'm sharing with another writer, I will sometimes ask like, are you gonna use that thing that just happened between us? Cause I, I want to, like, I don't want to take it. If you're <laughs> gonna, you're going to take it. Um, Phoebe or Ryan, do you encounter that sort of in your, stuff in your real life that's maybe coming part of stuff you're writing where you have to feel some protective bubble around certain things? Um, Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited to hear what you were going to say. I was on um, the edge of in. my seat. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, 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 well, I mean, I don't, I don't know about protective. I, you know, sometimes something, if something completely wild happens and then we have some sort of expectation that we come 90 degrees to and we're all sort of freaking out about this funny thing that just happened and I'm amongst a group of people that may or may not be writing screenplays, I might sort of do the same thing John's doing where I might say, can I use this? Cause it's fantastic. I really, I think I could do it justice, but um, no. And, and certainly I don't write anything autobiographical other than it's about m myself. 
Um, and I did enjoy playing John with John five feet away from me every every scrutinizing moment um, in his home, lo those many years ago. Uh, but uh, but no, I, I don't I, I don't know. I, I do I, I think I, I I look at it more like influence. Like I when I was younger, I was in a writer's circle online. Uh, this is about fifteen years ago, and there was heavy weight writers on this thing. I mean, all over the place. But you could sort of lurk as well and i was always too nervous to jump in this circle and you know uh write stuff but i i certainly learned so much from from these voices there were so many distinctive voices in these in these writers rooms and um while trying never to steal from any of them i did sort of learn about sensibilities and different how they can be just so completely polarized um so yeah phoebe do you do you ever wrestle with the fact that a lot of people think you are Fleabag and Fleabag is you? Um, yes, but I don't, um, I don't have any, it's not so much of a, a wrestle. I just sort of realized that because so much of it, it, it's not autobiographical, but it is really, really personal. So I think, mm -hmm. and I think that question is so beautiful about, do you feel like people actually reach out a bit more? They don't judge you. They actually are so relieved when they feel that there's something's honest and truthful. And I think, um, when I was writing stuff before Fle Fleabag was a moment, I just thought, oh, fuck, I'm just going to write this. And I think when you have that feeling, sometimes that's when you kind of, I don't know if you guys have had that, but when you just go off. And when I first started writing the series, I had, um, I was writing what I thought a TV show version of Fleabag should be. And I was writing that and I was getting really angry. No one told me to write it like that. No one said it. It was just the part of my brain that said, this is what people are going to want. And then I was angry writing that. And I got so angry writing it that I started writing what turned out to be the TV series as like rebelling against myself for writing the sitcom version. And I was like, and I was like, oh, okay. and I, was like I hate that they make me do this. And then I'm like, this right, is what yeah. I'm really gonna do. And then I sent that one off with a real like, fuck you to my producers. <laughs> and they read it, they were like, okay. And then I was like, and this is what I really wanna make. And they were like, well, good. Cause that is so much better. Why are you wasting your time doing that? And so it's quite confusing at the beginning trying to write something that sounds and feels like something people would like um but then there's always an emptiness yeah. about that and then the moment you start writing something that feels really personal and you get a little bit nervous writing it or um i remember in, in season two of fleabag I, when i was writing the speech when she, she does a speech um like two thirds of the way through and she's saying i just want someone to tell me what to do and she just does this whole list of like i just want someone to tell me what to wear what to eat and it felt a little bit dangerous writing that like as a kind of you know, central female character just going like, just tell me what to do. And um, and I was what re like writing it going like, oh God, I'm gonna get bashed for this. Like, how dare I say that that's what I'm a woman or anybody secretly wants underneath it all, let alone a, um, a kind of heroine of a story. And that was one of the things, speeches that people have been so uh, responsive to. And that's a really um, comforting feeling. Yeah, the, I think the, the audience is very good at detecting something that is true as opposed to something mm -hmm. that is uh, designed to seem true. Mm -hmm. and, and so their willingness to forgive things because we are complicated people, they, it's, there's a subtlety there that they just got. I, I got it, you know, and I saw it. I just thought that, oh, this is, this actually, I understand, even understood that it, why it was a dangerous thing for her to be saying, aka you to be saying, and I also understood, therefore, that it was a different thing than you are weak and I do want to be dominated or told what to do. It was really more of this, it was an instinct we all have that is different from our, it's, it's complicated. I got the, I got the complexity. It worked. It worked beautifully. Well done. Good, Good job. Oh, Steve. Yeah. yeah. But it's yeah, funny because when you do something like that, you just don't care how you get judged because you feel like it's truthful. Right. And then I was just like, that is, that is true. And I'm going to stand by that character in that moment. It usually works. When you're being false, you, it's far more scary because you're like, yes. are they going to find out? Mm. They're going to find out. And they, they always do. They always do. Yeah. Right. Um, it's come time for our one cool thing. No. Oh. Craig, do you want to start us off with oh. the one cool thing? Yes. Uh, yes, I do. And and look, we've done a great job, I think, of keeping this a light, lovely podcast. We're not, we're not uh, getting all down, but I'm just going to hit my microphone. Even in, even in, the best of times, I, I have some anxiety problems, <laughs> just just vague, medicated anxiety problems, and so um, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I've tried all sorts of you know the cool meditation apps and the things like that, but the thing that generally works the best for me is just good old breathing. Just simple deep breathing does miracles. But 
then I start getting in my own uh, Jewy way. I start freaking out that I'm breathing wrong, which is the most Jewish <laughs> thing I can think of. Like, am I breathing right? Did I count enough? <laughs> so, so I'm trying to remember this. And um, a couple of years ago, and this just got recirculated around, a guy named Nathan Pyle made some little animations, some little web animations um, to help you breathe rhythmically in a nice deep breathing way. And they work so beautiful and they're very simple. It's just like a ball rolls, rolls down a little hill and up the hill and you can sort of breathe along with them and they're wonderful. And for whatever reason these days, I've, I've felt the need to do quite a bit more of that. So um, if you have, um, if you're prone to anxiety and you're prone to those moments where you're feeling a bit jelly legged or butterflies in the stomachy or just afraid and you feel like a nice little deep breathing session would help, um, we'll, we'll include a link to those um, uh, because I find it a, a wonderful tool. Excellent. Yeah. Now, Craig, on a previous show, you had talked about Horse Paste, which is a sort of version of code names that's online. Yeah. Uh, Megana and the rest of the office, we were trying to play that yesterday and it was down. Um, so oh. instead we, we went, so maybe it's back up now, but oh, instead okay. we played uh, Drawful 2, which is on jackbox.tv, uh, which was actually tremendously fun. So it's a thing that's probably most designed for playing on Apple TV with people in a room together and you're drawing on your phone. Um, but it actually works really well over Zoom. And so you can share some one person's screen and then everybody else is drawing on their phones. And so it's a way to sort of have a, a party game when you cannot physically be together. So uh, jackbox.tv, it's a game called uh, Drawful 2. If you're looking for something to Drawful. play with your family, no matter where your family is or your friends. So something Excellent. out there in the world. Great. Ryan Reynolds, do you have a one cool thing to share with us? I do. Uh, I, 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 I have one particular podcast that I've, I've been going back back to since Christmas. John, I think I sent it to you. It was Anthropocene Reviewed. Mm -hmm. It's oh, yeah. uh, John Green's uh, John Green uh, novelist, screenwriter. He has this great podcast. It's a, it's a once a month. It's called The Anthropocene Review. I think it's the last Thursday of every month. Uh, but there's one particular episode that I've revisited right now in these times that we're living in, which can, uh, like you guys, are we're all needing to take some deep breaths. But it's basically about... Uh, Old Lang Syne, the sort of history of Old Lang Syne, the song Old Lang Syne, and where it comes from, and 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 its use, because it does actually have a use, uh, and it's heartbreaking, and it's yeah. so beautiful, and it's uh, it's one of the one of the most beautiful uh, uh, twenty two minutes of podcast I think I've ever heard in my life, and and I think it's really resonant for right now, so I keep going back to that. It's the it's the it's the podcast from just I think this last December. It's, uh, John Green's called the Anthrop Anthropocene Reviewed. I, I highly, highly recommend it. Excellent. Now I listened to that in a train uh, in Japan and uh, on your recommendation, it really is a terrific episode. Phoebe, do you have something to recommend for us? I do. It's a TV show, so it's not, um, it's not quirky, um, but it is, I feel so passionate about this TV show that I just have to say it. And I don't know if it's actually out there. I think it's being remade. It's a BBC show called This Country. Do you guys know of it? Oh, wow. This country. Yeah. This country, and it's by, uh, it's a brother and sister called Daisy May Cooper and Charlie Cooper wrote it together and it's based on their experiences growing up in the oh, Cotswolds. Oh, I've, I've, seen, I've, seen, I've seen much of this. It's excellent. It is so excellent. good. Mm -hmm. and yeah. It gets right under your skin and it is so funny and so witty and it's, it's a kind of documentary style, but their performances are so, so detailed and so extraordinary. And I, I, was, I was grief stricken when it ended and I just, and they're not going to make another one. They've made three series, but I think they're going to, someone, I think Paul Feig is remaking it in America, but catch theirs before, because it has so much heart. It's so funny and it is a really um, accurate depiction. Um, I'm thinking. The Cots, Cots um, yeah, I don't know if it's watchable here unless you're. Um, well, find a way. Well, in that, in that case, just just go with CSI Miami. <laughs> <laughs> it's a similar show. I have seen I think, it. Yeah. If you use a, a VPN and you and you can fake where you're where, then I think you can probably watch uh, the BBC on. Maybe you could buy really, it on iTunes. I don't know. Maybe there's. Yeah. It's possibly purchase. Obviously, you'd want to ideally purchase it if you can. It's 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 <laughs> extraordinary, and it's one of those shows where I started to feel like I was starting to learn a little bit about. Britain. <laughs> I was starting to learn. Yeah, yeah. And it's not it's it, not a side of it you see very often. No, no, it's not. It was and it was yeah. What did you fantastic. feel like you learned from it? Well, <laughs> there is actually there's this fascinating connection because I've now I've spent a bunch of time in the UK and I've started to come closer to this fascinating connection between people in Britain and people in the United States. I I mean, growing up, I used to think that like British people were, you know 
quite British and quite posh and, and everything was wonderful. And then we were just a bunch of rootin' tootin' Yosemite Sams just shooting in the air. And as it turns out, the, <laughs> the, the kind of like, I guess there's just a huge swath of rural America that matches up quite nicely in a weird way with Northern England and some parts of Southern England. And it's just the accents are wildly different, <laughs> yeah. wildly. But the general deal is not wildly different. And I, and it was, I was shocked at why I was shocked because yeah, yeah. it's where because everybody came from. Of it's course, the, yeah, it's, we're the it's same. everywhere. <laughs> it's literally yeah. the same. And then I just start to, and, and we did spend, you know, for Chernobyl, we had, I don't know, probably of our cast, I think 90% was UK. And of that 90%, probably 50% were Northern England and, I just, I, I mean, and, and this isn't to say that I didn't love everybody from London, but the folks from, from Northern England are awesome. And Scotland are awesome. I mean, it was just, I had the best time and they were, it, they just felt like home in a weird way. They felt American. And so the, I, I, I love that show because there was like a weird camaraderie in the, in the clumsiness and the, the brokenness, but beauty, you know, of, of yeah. our people together. I, I thought it was great. Oh, that's oh. lovely. Um, that is our show. So Scriptos is produced by Megan Arau, who yeah. I get to see. Hi, thanks, Megan. Hi, it's edited hard. by Matthew Cellelli. Right. Um, special thanks this week to Nima Yosefi and Dustin Box for helping us out. Um, our outro is by John Spurney. If you have an outro, you can send us a link to ask at johnox.com. That's also the place where you can send longer questions. But for short questions on Twitter, Craig is at CL Mason. I am at John August. Phoebe, you're not on Twitter and you're so smart about that. So smart. Uh, Ryan, <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead. And then, and then Ryan then, is um, at tell us what Van dummies City. Uh, thing is. What is it? At Van City. At Van City. Van Reynolds. City Reynolds. Yeah. Oh, Van City, City Reynolds. Yeah. Ryan Reynolds um, was taken. So of course. Yeah. Of course. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can find the show notes for this episode <laughs> and all episodes at johnox.com. That's also where you find the transcripts. Uh, you can sign up to become a premium member at scriptnotes.net, where you get all the back episodes and bonus segments, including the postmortem on this episode. But really, all what will there be money. to talk about? Oh, so much money. So much money coming in. Coming wow. in to, to John. Uh, Phoebe still Waller-Bridge, still <laughs> Ryan Reynolds, thank you so much Thanks, for being guys. our very first ever video guests. Uh, this was remarkable. Thank you so, so much. Thank you to you everybody who watched. I'm supposed to tell you because we're on YouTube that you have to push that like button and subscribe. But smash that like button. Smash, smash it. it. Smash I don't button, care. Yeah. Don't subscribe if you don't yeah. want to subscribe. Wow. Thank you both very, very much for being on the show. It really means a lot. That you, you, thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Oh, thanks You're the so best. Thank you. so have a great lovely. One. It was a pleasure. Bye, Bye guys. Please don't touch your face. <laughs> I pure all. Right. Are we? Is that? Is that it? Do we? Do we go home? Do we all go home? Go we home. All, I'm go just home. gonna push on through, guys. I'm gonna hang here and push on through. <laughs> so, you guys time. get out of here. All right. Baby, have a great night. Bye, Thanks, guys. Bye, Bye, Bye. 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 Nice to see you guys. Adios. Bye.